creatures that God has created, he's given to human beings the privilege that we can be a part of his family directly, not just by creation, but by inheritance, possessing the divine nature and becoming his family by extension. As a part of love, the divine nature wanted a family all of its own. And that is why we have a reproductive drive, which is a representation of the drive within God to multiply himself and to extend his family. So when it speaks of we are made in the image of God, we are not to limit it to think in terms of just feature. There are many ways in which we are made in the image of God. And one of those is that desire to have a family all of its own. Down, down. Turn it down a to have a family all of its own. And human beings will possess the divine nature in a way that other creatures will not possess it. We are going to be God's children by reproduction, possessing the divine nature and living with him in a way that only redeemed humanity can experience. All right, last week we had our communion service in which Christ would have demonstrated to us the, the love of God and his willingness to come down to the lowest creatures in the universe to lift us up to be the highest, to be a part of his family and the extension of the divine nature. We're going to continue today in John chapter 8, the light of the world. And we're going to read from verses 12 to the end. John chapter 8, from verses 12 to the end. Responsibly, I begin. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, No, I Come again. All right, John chapter 8, verses 12 to the end. Responsibly, I begin again. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore say unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. And yet after your flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written on you alone that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bear witness of me. Then say unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me, nor my Father. When ye have known me, ye shall have known my Father also. These words spake Jesus in the te treasury, as he thought in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and, and I shall die in your place. Whither I go, he cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he said, Whither I go, he cannot come. And, and he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of the world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then they say unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same I have said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he speak of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. 
and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The answer is, We are Abraham's seed, and we never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou that ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye have to kill me, because my word hath not placed on you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. The answer is unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you are Abraham's children, you will do what you have given But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then they say unto him, We be not born of fornication, we are born of our father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, speech even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And when because I tell you the truth, truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto them, Him, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and he do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Very, very, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. <laughs> Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. And thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are the dead, whom are they Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I shall say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and he keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast not seen Abraham. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I see unto thee, to you, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. And then took the other stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so fast by. And now, here you see light being manifested and being rejected. The very first text, John 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. And here the light was shining in its brightness upon them, and they were still in darkness. The noonday of the earth's history was midnight for the Jewish nation. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God, as Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, was shining upon them. And they were in darkness almost equivalent to the dark ages because their minds were locked in and their eyes were holding. Not because God was holding them, but because they were unwilling to accept the light that was distasteful to them, to use that expression. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God was shining to them brighter than any other man had ever revealed it, and to them it was darkness. 
walk while ye have the light. The light can be at its brightest and still be dark because that person is not willing to walk in the light. And Christ had to speak to them clearly and directly because he knew where they were headed. And in this discourse, we see him revealing that the source of a person's behavior is based on the person's father. And we're speaking now spiritually. <laughs> so there are only two fathers in this world when it comes to spiritual things. Either we are a child of God or we are a child of the devil. Verse 44. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and a bold not in the truth. Because there's no truth in it. Which tells us that there was a point in time when the devil was in the truth. Amen. All right? There was a time, if you're not abiding in it anymore, that means there was a time when you were Fine. abiding in it. And he was called Lucifer, the morning star, or son of the morning, which means he was connected to all the light. The light of God came to him first. God, Christ, through the Spirit, Lucifer. And the invisible agency of the Spirit is not mentioned in, in Revelation 1, 1 to 3, the order that reveals it, nor is it mentioned as revealed in the book of Daniel. But that is the medium, the invisible agency of the third person, of the Godhead. Now, if you have, by the cuckoo word in these early ages this morning, if you have a third person, what does that tell you? That there's a second and a first person. And this formula is revealed in the Word of God repeatedly, and we can even apply it to what we call the three angels' message. The third angel is mentioned. And we know, numerically speaking, before the third would have to be the second, and, the and before the second would have to be the first, and therefore after the third would also have to be the fourth. The fourth. Unfortunately, Adventists can't count beyond three when it comes to angels. They can't count beyond three when it comes to angels. They can only get up to one, two, three. Revelation is the book of sevens, and they can only count three, three angels. The third person of the Godhead. Father, First, son, second, spirit, third. And in that third person, there is a content of all three. We can distinguish the Godhead for purposes of study, but we cannot separate the Godhead. So when the wisdom comes, he brings all of the power and the love with him. When the love comes, he brings all the wisdom and the power with him. We cannot separate it. So when we get the spirit of God, we have all of God in him. The mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Now, according to the quotation, he would come with no modified energy. In, in my profession, when we use the word modification, we make adjustments to the engine to get more power out of it. You can add extras. You can add a turbocharger. You can add uh, extractors. You can a straight money fuel. You can add things to get more power out of that engine, we call it modification. There isn't anything we can add to the spirit to get more power out of it. We get how much of it? Oh. Oh. And that is what is needed to deal with sin. Because sin is the principle of using power right. unrighteously. Therefore, when we get God's power, it only functions in righteousness, so it takes all of that to keep us from sin. No modified energy. And sadly, the Jews did not see, right before their eyes, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do, or the desire. So when we have God as our, as our father, whose lust will we do? God. And don't worry about the word lust. The word simply means desire. When we have God as our father, we will desire and do the things that are of God because that is the nature that we possess. And when we have the devil as our father, we will also do his lust and his desires, which are towards evil. And here they were planning to kill the Son of God. And they could find no better comparison than to call him a Samaritan and a devil. Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has a devil. No wonder the disciples marveled when Jesus came back and found Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman. 
because they had the Samaritans to be devils, and the majority of Samaritans were much better than the Jews. Because it was a Samaritan that took care of a Jew when two of his fellow Jews, men in office, Levite and priest, passed him on the side. And one whom they regarded as a devil, Samaritan, and wouldn't speak to, stopped and displayed God's character. The Samaritan revealed that God was his father, and the priest and the Levite in him revealed that they were the children of the devil. It is not the profession. It is the <coughs> father, the nature that we have, that makes us God's children. He abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own as his native tongue. He's the father of lies. He's a, for he's a liar and the father of it. What we speak reveals who our father is. Back to verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. So if we are in darkness, it simply means that we are not following Christ. And if we have Christ, it is impossible for us to be in darkness. For the Jews, all their profession, that they were God's people and had the light, was empty because they were in darkness. And that which Christ was testifying was not his own testimony. That was the word that the Father gave him. So when they accused him of bearing witness of himself and it being false, it was they who were false because they did not understand his witness or see the light because they were the children of the devil. And as bright as the light was, from the beginning, Lucifer looked at infinite love and the brightest light in the universe and saw darkness in it. Now, if somebody were to turn on a 500 watt bulb in front of you and you don't see it, it means that you are blind. totally blind. And you blind, you still see it. <laughs> totally blind. Somebody turns on a 500 watt bulb in front of you and you don't see it, it means that you are totally blind and this is what Lucifer experienced. He was in the presence of God, light at its brightest, and saw darkness in it. Saw darkness in pure light. Verses 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Because they were still in darkness. And the record that was given to them by God, they had rejected. So when the light came again, it was still as if it was darkness. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. And he says in, in John 3, this is the condemnation. The, well, we, we know verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is the condemnation that men love darkness rather than light. And this is the condemnation now to the Pharisees and the Jewish nation, that the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus that is sent to them is rejected because they wanted to maintain their darkness. And their condemnation would be that light was sent to deliver them and they chose to remain in darkness. Or condemnation as the Adventist world, part of the Adventist world, and as individuals. Or condemnation would be that the light was sent and we have rejected it. It can get very little brighter than it is now. When it gets to the loud cry, it is going to be at its brightest. According to Revelation 81 to 4, the whole earth, if you're going to lighten the whole earth, the light has to be exceedingly bright. All right? The light has to be exceedingly bright in order for you to lighten the whole earth. Verse 17, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. 
and, and this is the Lord would have given them, you could not condemn a person on death on the testimony of one person. Two or three witnesses you needed because you can have a bias, a opinion or a testimony if it is only one person. So you needed at least two witnesses for the condemnation. Verse 7, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Now, who gave this law? It is, it is Christ who sent your law. It is Christ's image. This is your law. That is the law that you have a need because that is the way you operate. The law of God is different. It is your law. That is your law. Those are the laws that are given to them because of the kind of persons they were. Verse 18. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bear witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, You need to know me, know my father. If he had known me, he should have known my father also. Why? Because he came to do what? Reveal the Father. If they knew God, they would have known his son. And if they knew the son, they would have known his father. And the Lord testified of him at his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And they did not recognize his voice. Only those that were converted. John the Baptist. And those who had come there and were genuinely converted heard the voice of God because they would have been his children and were able to recognize his voice and knew this testimony, this is the Son of God. And there were many who were baptized at that time and did not see nor hear. Did not hear that voice. They said what? They thunder. Because they were not tuned into the voice of God. And as I said last week, I can close my eyes and ask any one of you to say something and tell it, tell who you are because I am familiar with your voice. If you do not know your father's voice, you are not his child. They thunder to them because they are not in harmony with God. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And they, the fact that they were planning to kill him is evidence that they were not children of God. Jesus said it in John 16. Turn over quickly, John 16, 1 to 3. Identifying those who will do the work of the devil and claim to be doing the work of God. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time killeth, that whosoever killeth cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known me, nor the Father nor me. They have not known the Father nor me. Those who kill think that they're doing God's service, do not know God, and they do not know Christ. You cannot know God and think that you're doing him service by killing people, which is a clear statement that the papacy is not oh God. the church of God and the people of God. And you never have to get the killing. You know? don't, wait, don't, don't wait till you get down to the, step, to the stage where they're going to execute you. Go up to verse 2. They shall pull you out of the synagogue. Anybody that read you out of the church and have a different opinion, don't know God either. Amen. Amen. Okay? So you don't have, this is just the first step. <laughs> okay? Putting you out of the synagogue is step one. And when you decide to firmly to stand on the principles of truth you believe or no, they will go on to set to, and that is to execute you. So I don't think they have to come down to step three in order to demonstrate that they do not know God. The very first step of putting you out of the church is the persecutory principle, and that reveals they do not know the Father nor the Son. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Step one. Yea, the time cometh. That whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And Jesus said, don't be offended because once you know God and you know the great controversy, you will understand the motive behind it, that they are the children of the devil. So be careful. That spirit don't rise up in you. If it does, check. You are stepping out of being a child of God and into being a child of the devil. Back to John 8.
if you had known, verse 19, then said unto them, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, You need to know me, nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also because they were one. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid his hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Now, while he was speaking, the Spirit of God would be brooding over the environment mm -hmm. and bringing a convicting spirit and a restraining influence to keep them in check. At that point, whenever he's ministering, the Spirit of God would bring a restraining influence and keep them in check to a certain extent. And they were not able to lay hands on him. Now, back in Galilee, in Luke 4, when he presented the truth, a prophet is not without honor except his own country. At that point where he grew up with them, this is how the heart is hardened. Jesus would have grown up in Galilee and they would have seen him on a daily basis over the years. And seeing that perfect and sinless life demonstrated before them. And all along they were rejecting and resisting and rejecting. And when it came to this point when he presented that message, their final rejection of it flowed over in a desire to kill him. Those who are exposed to the truth. And that is why the particular Pharaoh who was on the throne when Moses came to deliver Israel, it isn't, it isn't that God hardened his heart. The chances are he was growing up when Moses was growing up in Egypt and seeing the light of God revealed in the life of Moses and hardening and rejecting it. So by the time Moses came back 40 years later, he would have gone up to the throne and he would have been hardened by exposure to the light and rejecting all of it that would come to him in the life of Moses. And when the light came again, his ever-hardening heart reached a stage where he was resisting the Spirit of God. All right, back to John. Verse 21, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. And they could not come, because they were not God. of God. And Jesus has said to us, he said to the disciples, he's going ahead to prepare a place for his children. And those who are born again can go to that place. Those who could not go there then, would mean those who would not have been born of the Spirit of God, not children of God, so they couldn't come there. It isn't that Christ wanted to go and leave them, but they did not want to follow him. They did not want to meet the conditions that would make them a part of his kingdom. Verse 22. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he said, whether I go, he cannot come. Inside of them, they believed that there is no place that they were not qualified to go. They were so fixed in their mind that they were God's people that there's no place anybody else could go where they could not go. And as Jews, they had the privilege to go into the earthy sanctuary and enter areas that uh, Gentiles and Greeks could not come. There was a barrier beyond which those except Jews could not come. So since they could go in, where can you go that we can't come? Are you going to kill yourself? Verse 23, and he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Here's the difference. Are we either of God or, or not? Are we from this earth? God our Father or Satan our Father? And we are all children of Satan by birth because of Adam's sin. And God sent Christ to be our second father to give us another birth and to give us another nature. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am in he, and he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. But they wanted to get from him a statement that he was the Messiah, so they could raise up a resistance against him, criticize and condemn him, and get the people to reject him. But he spoke the truth in such a way that they would have no evidence for rejecting. He was trying to reach them as well as he was trying to reach all who would come there. I have many things to say unto judge of you, but he that sent me is true. 
and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They answered not that he spake to them of the Father. And they did not understand because they were not born of God. Spiritual things are spiritually designed. It is a spirit that brings conviction because when a person is born of the spirit, they will recognize the voice of the spirit and he will bring into them that which they need to know to make them a part of God's family. Verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and I did nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And many of them, when he was lifted up, still did not understand, because in their minds, he was an imposter that needed to be crucified. And that is why they chose the worst of death for him, to make him look to be the worst criminal, and nobody would believe him. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Would to God that we could have this testimony that God has not left us because we do always those things that please him. And this is the testimony the Father gave of Christ from his baptism. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And Christ had not yet begun his, uh, his public ministry. He was just going to enter on his public ministry, his life from birth to this point was pleasing to God. And the Lord set the seal upon it by giving him the spirit in his latter rain measure to go forth and give an additional and final testimony to the rest of the world. He that sent me is with me. The Father have not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. If God has sent you, have the assurance that he's with you. And once you're in harmony with him and doing his will, he's not going to leave you alone. Our danger is us departing from the Lord. Always we leave the Lord, never the Lord leaves us. As he spake these words, many believed on him. There were some who were looking for the truth, striving for it. And there were some who were trying to prevent him from coming to that understanding. The truth. Then said Jesus to those Jews with verse 31, believe on him. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is the condition? Continuing in the word. This is what makes us disciples because God does everything through his word. That word has the power in it to make us sons and daughters of God. John 1. Uh, and we find in John the love of God and the principles of the conversion experience. In more detail, it is not found in any other gospel than in the gospel of John. John 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. The first tree <coughs> reveals the fact that we are born of human nature. Blood, will of the flesh, will of man, and the other is of God. So there are always those two births. The first tree Categorize it as human being, flesh, blood, and the will of man. And the latter one as the will of God. God has given to us the right to become what? Sons of God. When we believe it through that word, it makes it real to us. Verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Since it is done through the word, and words are thoughts made audible, then God had to put his word in a tangible, visible form for us to be able to receive it. It is the word that enables us to become God's, son, God's sons, so the word had to become one of us so that we can become one with him.
back to chapter 8. And he shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Until we come to a knowledge of the truth, we are in bondage to error and darkness. We are in bondage to sin. And they, 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 Jesus goes on here. They said, verse 33, they answered, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, he shall be made free? How blind can you be? They are in bondage to the Roman nation as he is speaking. The entire Jewish nation is in bondage to the Roman nation as he speaks. And they say we be Abraham's children and we're never in bondage to any man. And they were right at that very moment in Roman bondage. Could not crucify the Son of God without permission from Caesar. Caesar well, Caesar and Pilate because they were in bondage. And they did not want to see the truth. This is how blind they were. We be Abraham's children and were never in bondage to any man. From Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes, Egyptian bondage. 430 years, the Lord said to Abraham, 430 years, they're going to be in bondage. If they knew the history, and they knew the history, they know that they were in bondage before. So don't say that you be Abraham's children were never in bondage to any man. You were in bondage in Egypt, came out of Egypt, and went into bondage into Babylon, came out of Babylon, I went back home, I went into bondage from the all the way up to Rome, still in bondage, still thinking they were free. And there were many times throughout the history, all through the judges, where they were liberated and captured. Liberated, bondage. Liberated, bondage. And could speak and say, we be never in bondage to any man. Christ was speaking, and he's speaking spiritually, but he also had a literal application because he wanted them to see their true condition, and the only way they could be free was if he set them free. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. And he's using an analogy, now he's coming to reality, you are the servant of sin. And there's a difference between a son and a servant. He said the son, the servant does not abide in the house forever because a servant can be dismissed. The son inherits it forever. And he's speaking then though, he's the son of God and will abide in God's house forever. They are servants. Until they become sons, they would not qualify to be in God's house forever. And towards the end of his ministry, he said to them, your house is left unto you desolate. Because they did not become God's sons. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Our freedom will only be when we are in Christ, because he's the only one that has never sinned. So if you go back then to verse 34, whosoever committed sin, is the servant of sin. And the only person that has never sinned on this planet is the Son of God. So if we are going to be free, where must we be? In right. Christ. As long as we are outside of him, we are in bondage to sin because we sin and we are the servants of sin. The only one that has never sinned is the Son of God. The only place we can, know, we can therefore be only free is being in Christ. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word have no place in you. And they were Abraham's children, blood descent. They needed to become the sons of Christ by spirit. Yeah. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So we can see the two bloodlines. The flesh and the spirit. They were Abraham's children by descent. They could all prove which tribe they were from. And 
coming down through Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, each one of them could have told where they were from. But when it comes to being children of Abraham by faith, they were foreigners to the divine nature. But now you seek to kill me, verse 40, a man that I've told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father, then say they to him, we be not born of fornication, we have one father, even, there, even God. And do you not find the same spirit many times you present the truth, and the person cannot gain say, and if look to scandal, we have one father. We be not born of fornication. Here's the church leadership. Going back 30 years to the circumstances surrounding his birth. He was conceived before Joseph knew Mary and the rumor ran around. She got pregnant outside of wedlock. 30 years later, the church, church leadership still remember it and is casting it in his face. We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus just said to them, you don't know God because God would not behave like that. So they're now trying to say that they're God's children, but the behavior is revealing that they are Satan's children. And I like, let me see, I like how Ellen G. White responds to it in when they made this, as she called it, a base accusation. Page 468, these are ages. Jesus denied that the Jews were children of Abraham. He said, you do the deeds of your father. In mockery, they answered, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. These words, in, a, in allusion to the circumstances of his birth, were intended as a thrust against Christ in the presence of those who were beginning to believe on him. Jesus gave no heed to the base insinuation, but said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. So how are we to respond to those things? No heed. Jesus gave no heed to the base insinuation. And that will happen at times. You present the truth and a person can't get around it. Instead of acknowledging that it is truth, given the error, they find something to try and retaliate. This is the church leadership speaking to the Son of God who's presenting truth. And Jesus just let it slide by like water on a duck's back which is the duck's feathers are waterproof and the water just roll off and did not even think to retaliate about it and it was evidence then that the spirit that they were driven by was not the spirit of God it was evidence that the father that they had was not God the father and it was simply coming out of them that they were children of the devil and what a condition that nation was in since this is what the leadership was really revealing. All right, back to desire. We'll get back to desire ages uh, next week. Verse 42 Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Now, this is not only that Christ came to earth as a human being, but he proceeded forth and came from God in the distant eternity. Because remember, since you have the third person, there's the second person, and then the first person. That is an absolute order. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One, two, three. First, second, third. So he proceeded forth and came from God. And this is at the... All right. That's the beginning of creation. All right. In order to create the, the second person, step out of the first into time to bring creation into existence. So he said he proceeded forth and came from God. In the first, proceeded forth. And then he proceeded forth and came even further down when he took on our human nature. If they were of God, they would have understood. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me because it is the love of God that 
pushes God to do what he does. It is love that drove him to create. It is love that drove him to give his son to redeem us. But he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you cannot hear my word. Verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and a bore not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. So it is not only to have the truth, we must do what? Abide in it. We must stay in it. We must stay in it. Verse 45, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hear my, God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. If a person cannot be persuaded, if you cannot by principle in the word of God, show that the person is wrong, the only honest thing you should do is accept what is being said. He said to them, if you can convince me of sin, then you have a basis for not receiving me. But if you can't, then you should accept that that is the life of God because God is the only sinless being. The evidences presented to them could not be denied. But since they were not bent, since they were bent on not really believing him, their minds continue to reject that which they should not have even questioned. Verse 48, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has a devil? These are the Christians. This is the church of God comparing those whom they should be seeking to save to being a devil. To be a Samaritan was to be the equivalent in the eyes of the Jews to be a devil. And yet still, the devil behaved better than the Jews. The devil saw a Jew and stopped, took care of him, bound up his wounds, put him on his beast, took him to an end, paid for him, and left a surplus. When I pass again, and it's more than that, let me know, and I will take care of him. And that was a Jew that he was taking care of. And the sad part is, I wonder how much impact it had on that particular Jew exactly. who was taken care of. Because the servant of the Lord says in that account on these areas, if the situation were reversed, the Jew would despise in his face. Right. I wonder how much impact it had on him as a Jew to know that a Samaritan had taken care of him. Sometimes prejudice can be so deep-seated that you might have wished that he would, he would have died rather than have a Samaritan take care of him. Okay, that, that would be selfish right here. Yeah, sometimes you know, prejudice can go that deep that something you would wish I would rather die than to let you take care of. But the evidences would suggest that it might have had an impact on him to make a difference on that particular thing. And this is how God works because declaration doesn't work. He has to demonstrate something. And the person's character was not determined by his nationality. He was a decent person. He was a Christian. Son of God, because Jesus said to them, Go and do thou likewise. Say we not that thou art Samaritan and hast a devil. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do the son of me. But I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily I say unto you, if a man keep my sin, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my sin, he shall never taste death. Now, Jesus is speaking spiritually and at a high level, and it's beyond them. Because as far as God is concerned, the first death is simply asleep. When he speak, spoke of Lazarus, he said, Our friend Lazarus, sleeping. sleeping. There's a resurrection from that. But there's no resurrection from it the second death. So he's speaking to them in spiritual terms that they can understand the course they're pursuing. Verse 53. Are thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. 
it is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And how did Abraham see the day of Christ? In being told to offer his son, Isaac, God was giving Abraham a revelation of his purpose to give his only begotten son. As far as God is concerned, Ishmael should never have been born. So God is reckoning in the new covenant, and when he says his only son, he's speaking of Isaac because Ishmael is our covenant. And the only son that he should have had, which is by promise and the power of God because his wife was barren, should have been Isaac. So as far as God is concerned, Isaac is Abraham's only son. And when he told him to offer him, he was revealing to Abraham the plan of salvation in that he, God, was going to give his only son to die for the world. And this is how Abraham then had an understanding of the plan of redemption. He saw it and was glad. And the good news for Abraham was he was able to get back Isaac because the angel stopped him. And if you wondered why that's where the Lord sent him to that mount, because that's where he saw the ram caught. And the ram could take the place of Isaac. Unfortunately for, well, I use that word in terms of the fact that Christ had to go, but it's not unfortunate. It is our fortune that Christ did not have a way out. And that is what brings to us salvation. For Abraham, there was a ram caught in a ticket, and he was able to take Isaac back home with it. For Christ, there was no alternative. So he had to ask the question, ask the Father, why have you forsaken me? Is it possible that this cup can be taken from me? And the answer was no. The cup was taken from Abraham's lips because there was a ram caught in the ticket. Isaac could go free. There was nobody else that could take the place of Christ. And through this, God gave to Abraham a revelation of his purpose. And Abraham rejoiced to see the day and was glad because he got Isaac back and he also understood that God had provided salvation for him and all mankind. Abraham saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and as thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I see unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Since they were rejecting the light that was coming, the truth that was being presented, Christ had to speak in terms that they could not deny. And as the servant Lord says, when he used that phrase, his silence fell on the crowd. The name that God had given to Moses to display his eternal presence. And note the, the words in I am. You say, I was, I will be, I am. So whenever, wherever we go, there is God. If it was possible for us to Time travel and go forward a million years, God is there, so he's still what? I am. I am. Or if we could go back a million years, there he was and he's still I am. God dwells in an eternal present tense. That is why he said he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So even though they are dead to us, to God, they are alive because in his eternal state, he has this to say. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took the up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went up of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Brethren, today, Christ is still I am. He was I am to Moses, he was I am to the Jews here, and he's I am to us now, ever present. God is our refuge and strength, our very present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. He is I am now, and he will always be I am to us. If we allow him to be, we can understand and appreciate all that he means to us. He's the light, the way, the truth, and the light. I am the way. I am the bread of life. I am your Savior. Questions or comments before we close with a word of prayer. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. 
He's the light of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the light. If we walk in him, we cannot be in darkness. <coughs> <coughs> yes, in, in common, Elder, with the, again, with the, coming you main with the uh, Samaritan rescuing the Jew. It will be more selfishness or pride that he preferred to be dead instead of coming back and asking the guy, thank you for what you did for me. The, the chances are good he, he might not have known who would have taken care of him and would have saved his life. But sometimes prejudice can run so deep that he might have been inclined to wish he had been left to die rather than be taken care of by a Samaritan who they regarded as dogs and devils. If you would have heard the whole trip, because the servant Lord tells us it was not, it was not a fairy tale, you know, that was actual events that would have taken place. And when he would have been laying there, if the story was related to him, a Levite and a priest, and Eloi says that they were in the crowd. When Jesus was, was relating the story, the Levite and the priest were in the audience Mercy. hearing the story. Mercy. So imagine him hearing two of your own kind, Levite and priest, pass you by and didn't even look at you, and one from the proscribed tribe or nation, as you would call it, stopped, took care, took you to an end, paid for it, and leave a down payment for coming back. Either it would soften him or it would harden him beyond being reading. Because that kind of love should, should have touched his heart to let him see something is different about that person. But prejudice can be very, very deep-seated and strong because here you have it. Christ is revealing to them the light. And they were so bent on staying where they were, they were rejecting all the evidences that could be given. And Parisha does not say anything about this uh, Jew or the Samaritan either. But that could have been, well, a living test, not testimony, but, uh, but uh, Christ trying to reach out to this uh, man in, in doing. Yes, yes. And, he, and, and he's given, the, he's given the, the story of the good Samaritan. He was answering a Jewish lawyer, all right? A doctor of the law who asked him, who is my neighbor? No, you are a Jew. And you don't even know who your neighbor is? You gotta ask that question concerning who your neighbor is. And Jesus gave that example and it was fitting because it showed him your neighbor extends beyond your own kind. They had a problem with even some of their own kind because the scribes and the Pharisees were constantly trying to keep themselves ceremonially clean. So if you deal with certain people, they're gonna contaminate you and you gotta go back and clean up again. So they only kept certain as neighbors who would up to their level as they would think. And Jesus went even further to be picking the worst in their reckoning person to teach a lesson as to who your neighbor is. The Samaritan did not ask what is his nationality. He saw a human being in need and he did what the love of God would have done. Safe to say that there's a spirit of uh, a demonic control in the mind back then, and even on time up now too, because likewise, they yeah. still believe that there's yeah. a certain section of this Hasidic Jew are better than others. That those in Crown High, those in Borough Park, those in Mount in New York, like they like to mingle. They likewise, also bringing it to our time, our churches, black conference, black conference, that kind of different conference. Knowing that when we go to heaven, it's going to be only one race. So that, that, that prejudice, that I call it self, uh, what do I say? Not preservation, but self, I call it being better than others. You yeah. have to get rid of it, otherwise they ain't going anywhere. Of course, it, it shows that that is the spirit of the devil. All right? When people display that, it shows who their father is. Your father is the devil. Christ is father with God, and so he recognized no barriers or no distinctions. He saw in all men a soul that he would die for. And he treated all with the same respect, courtesy, and love. It is prejudice and being a child of the devil that makes a person think that they're better than another person or another race or another tribe and would treat them with partiality. So that Jews are Jews and they're not all Jews. Americans are Americans and they're not all Americans. Adventists are Adventists and they're not all Adventists. They have problems even 
in an organization that is supposed to be of God, and you have so many differences and so much practices that are contrary to the very principle of love and God, so that you have, as you mentioned, different conferences, black and white and stuff, when you're supposed to be an Adventist without any regard to any other consideration. Child of God, we are all one family. But the, the evidence is then, when you have that, that that person is not converted. You're a child of the devil because you're displaying those respective persons and differences that are not a part of the divine nature. All right, let us close with the season. Any?